This is part two of Revelation 18, and what we, this, that was actually a gift. <laughs> what we, where we got to in our last presentation of Revelation 18 was that in 1798, the time of the end arrived for the Millerite history, right? Um, in 1840, August 11th, 1840, the mighty angel of Revelation 10 descended with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, the restraint of Islam. Then in fulfillment of Habakkuk 2, the 1843 chart was introduced into history in May of 1842. And by June of 1842, the Protestants of the United States began to close their doors against the Millerite message, which had been empowered at this point when the testing process began. This history concluded on October 22nd, 1844. The Spirit was poured out at the midnight cry in the Exeter camp meeting from August 12th through 17th, 1844. There are other waymarks in that history. We're just addressing certain ones. The time of the end arrived for us in 1989 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. The message that we were given to carry to the world was empowered on September 11th, 2001, when there was a restraint placed upon what we call typically radical Islam by George Bush and the United Nations. That restraint that, that was placed upon them in a worldwide way had been prefigured by the restraint that was placed upon them by the four great European powers back in this history, four representing worldwide. It's in this history when the foundations of Adventism were laid. Those foundations are represented on the 1843 chart. And paralleling that, it's at this point in our history that the Lord begins to lead his people back to the old past, the foundational truths of Adventism, for specific purposes. And in doing so, he allowed God's people to see both these charts, which represent the foundations and pillars of Adventism. And thus begins the debate of this history over the truths represented on these charts, over the foundations, but thus also as a waymark, we see that these charts, as in the Millerite history, are giving us warning that the first door is about to close in this history because there's a door that closed on the Protestants here, and there was a door that closed on the Millerites here, and there was a door that closes in our history with the Protestants of the United States here, as this is the Protestants of the United States, and the second door that closes in this history is when Michael stands up at the end of human probation. Here is the loud cry. We pointed out earlier on in these presentations that the term loud cry, Sister White identifies as an escalating increase of knowledge. It has to do with increasing power. So when you understand that, you can understand how Sister White can say the loud cry of the third angel arrived in 1888. The loud cry of the third angel actually arrived on October 22, 1844. And as each pre preceding moment provided more light on the third angel, then the third angel was getting louder and louder. Okay? But the perfect fulfillment of the loud cry of the third angel is right here when the door closes on Adventism at the Sunday Law in the United States. All right? Now, we, we, we got to a, the very tricky part last time. We took time to try to 
keep it simple, but I know from the questions that I didn't succeed fully on that. In the Millerite history, we mark the first angel's message as arriving in 1798 and being empowered here. So I'm marking the first angel here when it's empowered. Marking the second angel's here where it arrives. It's empowered here. And the third angel here in order to give us a point of reference for the repetition of this history. Okay? Our first angel's message is Daniel 11, 40 to 45 which we began to understand when Daniel 11, verse 40, was fulfilled in 1989 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was empowered here the same way that the Millerite message was empowered. The Millerite message was empowered with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire by the confirmation of the year-day principle, the primary rule that had been adopted by Miller and his associates. This message, identifying the final movements of the King of the North as it returns to take control of the world for the last time and comes to its end between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. That truth was empowered here with the restraint of Islam marking the descent of the angel. Um, this message was empowered the same way that this message was empowered by a confirmation of this most significant rule for our generation, that rule being that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter in the history of the 144,000. And the point of reference to tie this truth together that is addressed several times in the Bible and several times in the spirit of prophecy is the restraint of Islam here, is repeated here with the restraint of Islam. Of course, you cannot see that. You cannot see that if you are not standing on this platform. This is simple. We've had some presentations here this week about blindness. In this, in this history, there is blindness. Um, seeing, not being able to see. Hearing, not being able to hear. This is very simple. In both these charts, you have these war horts representing Islam. This is Islam of the first woe. This is Islam of the second woe. There's only three woes. How simple is it if the first woe is Islam and the second woe is Islam and the testimony of two establishes a thing, what's the third woe? Islam. It's Islam, all right? Islam is established by the truths that are represented on this chart and these charts were directed by the hand of the Lord based upon the Bible. The Bible identifies Islam as a symbol of Bible prophecy. And that symbol is placed on this chart. And as a symbol and a sign, this restraint of Islam here is prefiguring this restraint of Islam. And it is the confirmation of what has been taught since roughly 1995. That being that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter in the history of the 144,000. Okay, so when the angel comes down in the Millerite history, <clears throat> we see the first angel's message empowered. And when the Protestants shut their doors against the Millerites, the first temple cleansing is finished. How many temple cleansings were there in the history of Christ? There were two, one at the beginning of his ministry and one at the end. How did he cleanse the temple? According to Desire of Ages, divinity flashed through humanity, and those people that shouldn't have been in the temple fled from the temple. The angel that came down here, Sister White says, is no less a personage than Jesus Christ. On August 11, 1840, divinity flashed through humanity, and the first temple cleansing was underway. It ended when the Protestants closed the doors of their churches on June 1842. Amen. All right. The second temple cleansing is down here at the midnight cry, where the prophecy of Joel is fulfilled. And how many times is the prophecy of Joel fulfilled? Pentecost, Millerites, and today. All right. And the prophecy of Joel is a prophecy identifying the outpouring of the Spirit. Does, whether it's sprinkling, whether it's being measured, or the full outpouring, does the Lord pour out His Spirit upon people that are holding purposely onto sin? No, okay. 
So when he's pouring out his spirit here in the time period of the midnight cry, he's pouring it out upon people that have prepared their vessels to receive the Holy Spirit, and therefore divinity is flashing through humanity in this period, and the second temple cleansing is taking place, and it ends when the door is closed in fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins and in fulfillment of closing the door to the holy place. The trick here, when you begin to take this history and line it up with here, you know, and sometimes you, as you look at this trick, you have to, I come to the conclusion that it's purposeful on the Lord's part. He could do anything He wants. He doesn't have to make this just a little bit more difficult than it need be, but it is. All right? It is. This is this, when you get to this level where you're considering this truth, there's some things that you have to factor in. And the only people that will be able to factor them in successfully are people that are students of prophecy. And if you're not a student of prophecy, you're going to look at this and not see anything. Okay? But the trick here, at least from my perspective, is to recognize that the Protestants were judged first in this history, then the Millerites. But in this history, judgment begins with the house of God. And it ends with the Protestants. When the mighty angel of Revelation 18 descended on September 11, 2001, one misconception that we have been trained and programmed to understand in Adventism is that the earth is lightened with his glory at this point in time, and we automatically think that this is the revelation of Christ's character. All right? But Sister White, when she's speaking very specifically about this in Great Controversy 611 and other places, the glory of this angel in Revelation 18 is identifying the work that takes place at this point in time. You know what that work is? Mm -hmm. What is it? Judgment, Judgment of the living. Blood, 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 blood out of sin. Okay. But it's the work that's represented in the first link of the prophetic chain. And the first link of the prophetic chain is speaking about what? the everlasting gospel. The first link, if you bring the first link down here, in this history here, the earth being lighted by the glory of this angel, that work is the development, separation, and then manifestation of the seed of Satan and the seed of Christ through the testing of a prophetic message that's delivered to that generation. That is illustrated in a variety of ways. One way is in the everlasting gospel in the first link, Cain and Abel. We know that in that first link of the chain we have Christ and Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel being the fourth way mark, identifying the everlasting gospel. But we know that fourth way mark it comes down here to Revelation 18. That's where they're all pointing to, is this day and age. But another place that we see this everlasting gospel clearly portrayed is in the two temple cleansings. When this angel comes down, what does he have in his right hand? A little book. And what do you and I have to do with that little book? We have to take it and eat it and make it our own allow us to change us, and then what are we to do? Sure. Take the message of that little book and also put on our forehead of flint and take this message to the Seventh-day Adventist church. What a privilege, what a responsibility, that it isn't simply the message that accomplishes the everlasting gospel in Adventism. It's the message and those that carry the message to a rebellious people that will not receive the message. At least that's what Ezekiel and Jeremiah says. Right? So the everlasting gospel is not simply the message. It's the fact that the message is delivered to God's people in a little book, which they have to eat and then they have to carry. And this work began right here. Then we looked at verses 2 and 3 of Revelation 18, and this is one of the tricky parts, I still contend. 
that this is because you're at a level now of understanding where you can't be a novice and expect to understand the prophetic message that the line of the tribe of Judah is now unfolding. You have to keep up with the advancing glory of the third angel or you get left behind. Of course, there's ways to demonstrate this. This isn't just my opinion. There's ways to address this. We've talked about it here. That a message, a message is what? It's the latter rain. In this history, there are two messages. From here to here is the history of the first angel. From here to here is the history of the second angel. Our history is parallel. We have a two-step message. The first message in this history announces the opening of the judgment. The first message in our history announces the close of the judgment. They're both from the book of Daniel. Correctly understood, they're both from Daniel chapter 9. <laughs> they are, they are, okay. <laughs> the last six verses of Daniel 11 is part of Daniel 9. Right? Because Daniel 9 is the exp ex explanation of Daniel 8.14, the cleansing of the sanctuary. And the final work in the cleansing of the sanctuary is the last six, six verses of Daniel 11, because those are the events connected with the close of probation, and the close of probation is accomplished in the work of Christ in cleansing the sanctuary. All right, there's other ways to show it, but the last six verses of Daniel 11 is based upon Daniel 9, which is what, where the message of the Millerites came from, and it's also where the message of John the Baptist came from. Same three histories, the history of Christ, the history of the Millerites, the, our history, all based on Daniel 9. Uh, not, those three histories aren't all based on Daniel 9, are they? Yeah. They're based on Joel, are they not? <laughs> Joel is those three histories. Uh, maybe not. Maybe it's John 17, right? Okay. <laughs> Those three histories are the three histories that inspiration points to in probably the most important triple application of prophecy that we have to deal with. That takes these three histories and brings everything you need to see into focus. But you will only see it if you are willing to see it. All right. So in here, we have two messages. The first deals with the opening of judgment, the second with the close, and it, you know, the first in this history with the close of judgment, and the second in this history is where you see the outpouring of the Spirit, and the second in this history is where you see the outpouring of the Spirit. All right? But those messages are the latter rain. Okay? That's something the line of the tribe of Judah teaches us. And the first message is the former rain. The second message is the latter rain, and only those that receive the former rain receive the latter rain. Amen. So as you approach this time period, the former rain is the last six verses of Daniel 11. If you're going to war against that, if you're going to refuse to see that, and that's what it is, this is all simple. This is all simple, all right? <laughs> It's only difficult because of our inherited tendencies of evil that have been handed down from 6,000 years of sin and our lazy, spoiled attitudes. But if we get beyond that, through the power of the Holy Spirit, which He provides for anyone that wants to get beyond it instantaneously at the foot of the cross, if we get beyond that, this is simple. If we do not receive this message, we cannot receive the second message where the Spirit is poured out. All right? If you don't receive the former rain, you can't receive the latter rain. There's two messages. You have to receive them both. So when we get down to here, we're seeing the first temple cleansing of Adventism. Perfectly prefigured in the Millerite history with the trick that the Protestants were cleansed first in the Millerite history and the Protestants are cleansed second in our history. And when I say Protestants, I know about spiritualism, Catholicism, and apostate Protestantism. 
On September 11, 2001, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down and the earth was lightened with his glory. And that work that is represented by his glory is what Sister White says, the, the closing work. Mm -hmm. This is the closing work. This is the final work of Christ in the most holy place. And that final work is called the judgment of the living. All right? And then we're taken back to the foundations. Taken back to the foundations. In this time period, the rain is sprinkling. The rain sprinkling. I'd like to give you another example of the rain sprinkling. Okay? Turn with me, if you would. This is one of the links. I've mentioned one of the, the first link, the everlasting gospel. I'd like to bring in another link. Go to First Kings, chapter 18. Most of this is review. I'm in Second Kings. If you remember, how many remember going through the story of Elijah? Amen. If you remember, in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass after many days that Pastor Sankey nailed it down very clearly that that many days was the end of the 1260 days. And what's the end of the 1260 days? It's the time of the end. Right? Jezebel's been ruling here. Jezebel's been ruling here. Parallel histories. This is Miller. Sister White says Miller is Elijah. All right? Elijah, he's given a message just as Miller formalizes the message. What happens after the message is formalized? A divine symbol has to come down, right? Amen? Everyone with me? Amen. I, I, I know it's been a long week. <coughs> this is, this is a, especially a hard day because we stuck another one here at the end. But go to verse 15. Verse 15. At this point in the story of Elijah, he's found uh, Obadiah. And he's going to tell Obadiah, go get Ahab. I want to talk to Ahab. All right, at this point, Elijah... He's in power. He's taking control of the situation. He's saying to Obadiah, go get Ahab, bring him to Carmel. We're going to show what this is all about. You see the power, the authority? Obadiah says, I don't want to go. If you're not here when I get back, I'm going to die. He says, I'll be here. You just go get him. Isn't that what he says? Yeah. But notice verse 15. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I... Before whom I... Before what? Before whom I stand. Amen. Am I standing before you, Brother Mary? Amen. Okay. Amen. Way up there. So, <laughs> so right here is Elijah and the Lord standing before him. The Lord just came down out of heaven, did he not? Okay. <laughs> Correct? <laughs> By the word. You remember in Ezekiel 37, 10, when the, the breath is breathed into that valley of dead, dry bones, and they stand upon their feet, a mighty army? Same word. Same word. The Lord's standing there before Elijah. Right? Okay. Now go ahead um, to, uh, let's go to verse... Uh, let's start in verse 32, although Pastor Sankey covered this perfectly well. Here, here now, Elijah is going to build the foundations, right? He's going to restore that altar. And that, that's, that's our work, isn't it? Yes, it is. To repair the breach, to restore the past to dwell in. That's what Elijah's doing. He's restoring the, the foundations. In verse 32, it says, And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as as would contain two measures of seed. How many measures of seed? Ah, maybe, maybe it's just big enough to contain some seeds. All right? Maybe that's all it really means. Just big enough to contain some seeds. Or, or maybe these seeds are going to be 
measured. All right? Maybe this is a precise measuring that's going on, but let's read on. Big enough to contain two measures of seed, and he put the wood in order and cut the bullocks in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, fill four barrels with water. No, maybe he just said, just fill some barrels with water. Four barrels. I'm being pretty precise there. Pretty precise about measuring this water, is it not? Yeah. Hmm. Fill four barrels with water and pour it upon the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So I guess that was 12. What do we suppose the number 12 represents? God's people, right? The 12 sons of Jacob, the 144,000, 12 pillars in the city, 12 gates in the city, God's kingdom, God's people, um, 12, 12, are we not vessels? Oh, God's people are vessels. This is 12 vessels. All right. And they're getting water and they're, they're marking when the water is being measured. Right? And that's what we're saying. And this is part of the argument, okay? We've been conditioned in Adventism to think that the latter rain is poured out at the Sunday law and nothing else, but we've been showing very clearly from the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy here this week that at this point, there's a sprinkling. At this point, there's a sprinkling. At this point, there's a measuring of the water. And then comes the mighty manifestation of the power of God, right? Of course, we know what that is. Right? The fire comes down out of heaven. Of course, here we see judgment opening. And here we see judgment closing. And here, after the fire comes down out of heaven, we see the prophets of Baal judged. Right? And here we see the disappointment of the Millerites. And, and what, what did the Millerites have to do when they came to the disappointment? What did they have to What follows the third angel's message in Revelation 14? Uh, they, have to, they have to understand the Sabbath. Okay, over and over again at the disappointment, we see the number seven, right? With the disappointment of the disciples, where was Jesus on the seventh day? He was in, he was in the tomb. When Noah gets in the ark and the door is closed, that's one of the links, right? He's in there how many days? before it starts to rain. This number seven is often associated with the disappointment, right? So the disappointment here for the Millerites, they have to learn the Sabbath. The disappointment when Michael stands up, and here comes the seven last plagues, right? The disappointment here, what's the disappointment of Elijah immediately after the prophets of Baal are killed? He has to pray seven times. So brothers and sisters, we know. We know part of the argument is about the sprinkling and the full outpouring. And Pastor Sankey today, he covered it perfectly in terms of the latter rain being a two-step progression. Okay? Go with me just, just to remind us. And I know this has been covered more than once. Isaiah 27. Isaiah 27. Now, brothers and sisters... We should understand this fairly simply. In, in Luke 21, Jesus gives a parable about what our sign is for the end of the world. And when Sister White comments on it in Great Controversy, we don't have to be real, real deep Bible students to understand what Luke 21 is all about. Sister White tells us in Great Controversy, he says, Christ pointed his followers to the budding trees of spring. And that's in the context of what is the sign of the end of the world in Luke 21. And Sister White says, Christ pointed you and me to the budding trees of spring. And we've had several people prove from the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy this week. What is it that causes the trees to bud out in the springtime? What rain comes in the spring? The latter rain. All right. So in Isaiah 27, it says in verse 6, he shall cause them that come of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud. What causes Israel to blossom and bud? 
the latter rain. And fill the whole earth with fruit. When is the earth filled with fruit? At the harvest. And when's the harvest? Summertime. In this verse, we have the springtime and the summertime both marked. There's a progression for you. But this is in connection with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It comes in 12 buckets first. It's measured to produce the buds and the flowers. But in its second manifestation, it's poured out without measure when the fruit of the earth is coming to maturity. Amen? Amen. Okay, so let's, in this history, in this history, we haven't dealt with it here, we're not going to deal with it here, but we have dealt with it in the past, it's available. All right? This is, this is the history of, this is the history of Moses. This is the history of Christ. It's been demonstrated over and over again, but in the history of Moses, the Lord gave ancient Israel two tables as he entered into covenant with them. And by the end of ancient Israel, they were defending the, the law, those two tables, and they didn't even know what they were. And when he entered into covenant with modern Israel, he gave them the two tables of Habakkuk 2 to mark his covenant. And when Sister White speaks of these two tables, and we've had the quotes in here, she says, the truths on these two tables are the rock of ages. Who's the rock of ages? And I'll tell you what, probably 99% of Adventism, if you were to tell them that the truths on those charts are a representation of Jesus Christ, the rock of ages, they wouldn't see it. They couldn't see it. They can't see it. They couldn't see it any more than the Pharisees could see the Ten Commandments in Christ when he was walking among them at the fourth generation of their history. This is airtight, parallel. And in this history here, the final link in the chain and the fourth waymark of the chain, Revelation 18, in this history, right here, the Lord is entering into covenant with modern Israel. That's what's going on when the Lord is doing the work of blotting out the sins of his people, is he's entering into covenant with them. And when he's entering into covenant with them, he brings to their attention the two tables that he gave to them at the beginning of their history, right there. And that covenant, that covenant is marked in the second link of the prophetic chain in the story of Noah. Because the Lord entered into covenant with Noah, the fourth way mark in the link of Shem, Japheth, and Ham, and Noah. And part of the story of Noah and the covenant that comes down to us today, that is, the, the, the people in Europe, the people in Europe that have banded together into a confederacy to oppose this message, what do you suppose the truth they proclaimed at their camp meeting a few months ago was that they were identifying that made the distinction between this message and where they were? What do you suppose it was? Because it has to do with the fourth way mark in the story of Noah's link. It's this. Door don't close at Sunday Law. People teaching this message. They need to straighten that one out. You know what their logic is? Their logic is this. In the Millerite history, there was a closed door into the holy place, but there was also an open door into the most holy place. So when you bring that history of the Millerites down here to the end of the world to the Sunday Law, it means there's an open door at the Sunday Law. But Noah is telling us that when the Lord is entering into covenant with God's people, there's a closed door. And Sister White says, every generation has a closed door message. To, to take that dark of an argument against this message should be warning to us that the door's about to close and that the Lord is entering into covenant with his people right now.
if they're willing to participate. And if they're not, we looked at Joel's three histories and we looked at Joshua. When I say we, there was four of us that were sharing this particular job assignment. And you know who we are. We looked at Joshua, the seventh trumpet. In our history, in this history here, it's going to be the history of the seventh trumpet. And brothers and sisters, all the prophets in the Bible are speaking about our history. So when we see the, the references in the Bible to, to the trumpet, and we say, well, the Bible's speaking about the end of the world, what trumpet is there at the end of the world? Just the seven, is it the seventh trumpet? Is it? It's the third woe that arrives right here that marks the beginning of the, in, the judgment of the living, the sprinkling of the latter rain. And in Jeremiah 6, 16, let's go there. There's so many wonderful verses. It's just incredible. Once this truth is laid out, you virtually can't find a verse in the Bible. <laughs> it doesn't say something about this history. <laughs> Jeremiah 6.16 6, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see. What's the ways you're supposed to stand in? Eduardo, what's the ways you're supposed to stand in? No, it's not the old paths, all right? Well, everyone led you to believe that. You surrendered to peer pressure, my brother. Right. It's saying, stand in Adventism. Stand in Adventism. Stand ye in the ways. Look around in Adventism. Look at all the different ways in Adventism. Okay? There's only one way to really walk in. But all those other ways are the ways of death. All right, there, but there's a lot of ways. So the command here is stand in Adventism at the end of the world and look around what's going on. And then it says, and ask for the old paths. Don't ask for that way. No, don't want that way. Don't ask for that way. Don't ask for that way. Ask for the old paths and walk therein. And you will find rest. For, oh, that fits right in. Right here, the Lord's leading his people back to the foundations, which Sister White quotes Jeremiah 6.16 6, and says it's the foundation and the platform of Adventism. Stand ye in the old paths and you will find what? Rest. You will find rest as the sprinkling of the latter rain arrives. Right? And walk therein and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Ah, what's that saying? That in a point in time when we're supposed to walk in the old paths and receive the latter rain, there's a debate that starts, right? Keep your finger there, keep your finger there. <coughs> go, I like that word, debate. Keep your finger there and go to Isaiah 27. Verse 6. He shall cause them that come of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud. This is the springtime. This is the sprinkling that begins on September 11th, 2001. And fill the face of the world with fruit. This is the summertime. The summertime begins at the Sunday law. Doesn't it? Yeah. Revelation 18.4. Come out of her, my people. This is the harvest. Final harvest. Harvest is at the end of the world, and the end of the world is summer. Verse 6, verse 7. Hath he smitten? Hath who smitten? Ha has Christ smitten? Has Christ smitten as he smote those that smote him? What's that talking about? Was, was Christ judged and smote? Is he going to judge the way he was judged? No, he's not. He's going to judge righteously. All right? He was judged unrighteously. But the point here is, is it's telling us that the context of this passage is judgment. This is the judgment time. 
Or is he slain according to the slaughter of them that are slain by him? Judgment time. Context. Judgment time. Context. Spring rain. Summer rain. Now verse 8. In measure. What's in measure mean? It means when they bring the 12 buckets and dumping them in the trench. In measure. When it shooteth forth. What shoots forth? He pointed his followers to the budding trees of spring. And when that happens, thou will debate with it. Debate with what? Debate with the concept of a spring rain and a summer rain. Debate with the concept of judgment of the living. <laughs> Debate with the concept that it all begins in the day of the east wind. Ah, that it all begins when the east wind, the rough wind of Bible prophecy, is stayed. It all begins when there is a restraint placed upon Islam on September 11th, 2001. <laughs> okay, sorry. Go, let's go back to where Jeremiah 616. I wasn't interpreting that one, but I'm sure it was okay. <laughs> Thus saith oh, okay, all right. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways, stand ye in Adventism and see, and ask for, I'm back in 616 of Jeremiah, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Also I set watchmen over you. Prove it! How does he set watchmen over you? Well, I think you can go to the link of the chain that's represented by Eli and Hophni and Phineas. And who's Eli and Hophni and Phineas? In one sense, it's the first angel's message, the second angel's message, and the third angel's message, right? Because it's a three-one combination, it's all about the three angel's message followed by the fourth. What happens when we get to the third of these three individuals? There's a disappointment. Ichabod. The glory is departed. Where does that take place? It takes place at the third angel's message, the Sunday law. Right? At the Sunday law, the structure is set aside. Saul has just gone to the witch of Endor and received strong delusion. He's going to die the next day. Right? And Samuel's raised up. Okay. And I'm back to verse 17. Also I set watchmen over you saying, hearken to the sound of the, of the what? Of the third woe. But they said, we won't listen. Right? The prophetic chain, once you get the prophetic chain laid out, it's absolutely scary. If the line of the tribe of Judah has developed our prophetic understanding to this point, Then the Sunday law is about here. How do you know that? Well, yeah, you can read verse 19. That's a good way. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. To what purpose cometh there me incense from Sheba? To what purpose is this people praying to me? And the sweet cane from a far country, your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifices sweet unto me. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will lay stumbling blocks before this people, and the fathers and the sons together shall fall upon them the neighbor and his friend 
shall perish. Thus saith the Lord, behold, a people come from the north country. What link is that? That's the last three kings, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah that are taken down by Nebuchadnezzar at the Sunday law. Right? Wow. He's going to lay stumbling blocks before these people. And the next verse is what? The Sunday law. Just before the Sunday law, there's stumbling blocks before these people. Well, go to Second Peter. This is definitely not where I was going, but <laughs> Brother Dewey. <laughs> How about First Peter? Chapter 2, verse 4. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but choose, chosen of God and precious. Who's this living stone that we're supposed to come to? Hmm. Go to verse 2. As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so, be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. He's talking to people that taste the Lord. Who's the Lord? He's the Word. And what's the Word? It's the little book. So it's talking to the people that eat the little book. Right? To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed a deed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Who do you have to come to if you're going to eat the little book? <laughs> Jesus, because he comes down out of heaven with the little book open in his hand. All right? Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. The Lord's building the temple. Did the Lord build a temple in the Millerite history? How long did it take him? How long did it take him to build the temple in the history of Christ? 46 years. How long was it that Moses took to receive the instructions for building the temple? 46 days. And we're the temple of the living God, are we not? How many chromosomes do we have? 46. All right. Wow. This, this history here of 1798 to 1844 that is established by the 22520s, it's designed into the very creation of mankind. Amen. Wow. Amen. But William Miller didn't understand the Hebrew of Leviticus 26. <laughs> Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it's contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay stumbling blocks before this people right before the king of the north comes in at the Sunday law. Is, is that what that said? Wherefore also it's contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, this is the everlasting gospel. Unto them that be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed based upon the Hebrew of Leviticus 26 and the theology of apostate Protestantism, based upon that, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the, at the what? At the word, the message that's introduced to accomplish the everlasting gospel in every history. Being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. 
Go to Isaiah 28, 16, because Peter said, this is coming from the Old Testament. Verse 14, Isaiah 28. I said 16, but we'll start in verse 14. <laughs> Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Because ye have said, we've made a covenant with death, and with hell we are at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come up un unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hid ourselves. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation. Behold, I lay in the Millerite history two charts. Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Amen. Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet. And the hell shall sleep away the refuge of lies, and the water shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand, when the overflowing scourge, the king of the north, shall pass through. Then you shall be, shall be trodden down by it. For the time that it goeth forth, it shall take you. From the time that it goeth forth, it shall take you. For morning by morning shall it pass over, by day and by night. And it shall be a vexation only to understand the report. Why? Why is it a vexation to understand this report? Because when the Sunday law arrives, there's no way to get the oil. It's too late to get the oil. <coughs> Jeremiah 6. Verse 17. Also I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. Is the third woe a subject of prophecy? Well, in, in the link that's illustrated by Joshua and the seventh trumpet and the shout that brings down Jericho, okay, it's there, is it not? That's specifically marked. This is the seventh trumpet, therefore this is the third woe. But how about with the first decree, the second decree, and the third decree? What takes place in the history of the fourth decree? The streets and walls are built in what? During the distress of nations. During the angering of the nations. Troublous times. Brothers and sisters. The first message, the second message, it's the lion and the ass, all right? It is. The disobedient prophet, all right, the disobedient prophet. Did you catch this about Josiah? Josiah is, Josiah is the, prof, the prophecy that the disobedient prophet left recorded for Adventism that predicts this very people. The people that do the work of restoring the foundations and the people that get their head on straight by finding the curse of Moses. It's been sealed up since 1863 when the complete history of the 2520 comes to an end. When you add the 19 years on. When you add the 19 years on out here and you realize in 1863 what happened. Millerites ceased to be a movement and turned into a church. But this history, according to the spirit of prophecy, it's a movement again. And there's a difference between a movement and a church. 
Sister White says we should study the great reform movements because they all parallel one another and they all point forward to the final great movement. The Millerites cease to be a movement and the very foundational truths began to be sealed up and the first one to go was the one that marked 1863. Did you catch that with Brother Roland's presentation? But we must remember that William Miller did not understand the Hebrew. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, this truth, this truth, it's, it's just, it's unreal, is it not? Amen. It's unreal. This is 2520, anyone that would suggest, okay. I'm trying to cover these links, but th there we go. The disobedient prophet, Pastor Emiliano, he told us about Josiah. Do you remember the parallel he made about Josiah? He, he didn't quite get to there, but it's, it's nice. The parallel, he run through Josiah. He was what he was telling you, and I hope you saw it, is that the story of Josiah, it parallels the last six verses of Daniel 11. Do you remember the battle of Carchemish, which he pointed out was a long, drawn-out battle, and at the beginning of the battle of Carchemish, that king of the south attacks the king of the north, but at the end, it's no longer Assyria, the king of the north, it's Nebuchadnezzar. There's been a change in the king of the north, and the king of the north at the end, it sweeps away the king of the, the south, right? Do you remember that? That's Daniel 11, verse 40. Have you, and Josiah is clearly representing us at the end of the world in fulfillment of the prophecy of the Millerite history. What's the prophecy of the Millerite history that the disobedient prophet left recorded with Jeroboam? What's that prophecy? that this church here, it's the church that finally gets the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's the promise. We're the people that have been promised to be the 144,000 that perfectly reflect the character of Christ during the greatest crisis of all time. That's the promise that the disobedient prophet left with Jeroboam. He says, Josiah is going to be raised up He's going to do the work of restoring the foundations, and in the process of doing so, <coughs> he's going to clarify our responsibility about stewardship. It's in there, so we can talk about it. But also, also, he's going to find the 2520, and he's going to repent in sackcloth and ashes. But you ever seen, a, you ever seen a, a, a prophetic symbol go both ways, good and bad? They do sometimes, right? So how come it is it that Josiah dies at Armageddon? Why does just, why does Josiah die at Armageddon? He did die at Armageddon, right? He died at Megiddo, isn't that Armageddon? I just said that he represents the 144,000. 144,000 don't die at Armageddon. He's representing two classes of worshipers in Adventism. He's representing the 144,000. And he's re also representing the hypocrite in Adventism. What's a hypocrite? An actor. Someone that puts on a... A covering a false suit. <laughs> when he went to Armageddon, wasn't he putting on a, you know, he was kind of camouflaging himself, right? Wouldn't get up on the wall and stand for the Lord, right? I'm not really a Seventh-day Adventist. But why? Why did he die at Armageddon? When you're relating to Josiah as a symbol of the foolish virgins in Adventism. What message didn't he believe? The message from Pharaoh. He didn't believe the message of Pharaoh. What message is that? The message from God. No, 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 no. It's okay. It's from God. But what message was it? Oh, you know, don't you? You said it came, it came from Egypt, did it not? Well, what was the message about? Don't, don't, don't go come into war with, with me and Assyria. Ah, it seems like Josiah represents an Adventist at the end of the world.
that doesn't understand Daniel 11, verse 40. Right? This is what that, is, that history is about. Josiah couldn't be blessed by that history. He didn't heed the warning of the last six verses of Daniel 11, and he dies at Armageddon. Amen. Amen. Isn't that what the story is saying? Amen. Brothers and sisters, the angel Gabriel gave William Miller the starting points, and, and I, what's the word, Sister White and William? The commencement of the chain of truth. He's given God's people at the end of the world the links in the chain of truth, which are allowing us to take the prophetic history and bring it into such clarity. Why? I mean, this is... Because at the Sunday Law, the people that are connected with this testing message that accomplishes the everlasting gospel and Adventism, the Bible says they're lifted up as an ensign before the world. So when's that lifting up start? It starts right here. Brothers and sisters, the people that are in this message are going to become an ever-increasing point of controversy in Adventism. There's some people in here that are probably under conviction of this message and they're thinking, there's got to be a way to clean it up a little bit where I, don't, where I don't have to suffer the wrath that I can see this message is going to bring me if I do the will of the Lord. Because the will of the Lord is to allow the Lord to put a flint forehead on you and take this message to the rebellious house of Israel. Okay? There's got to be some of us that are saying that. But prophecy says the messengers of this message, which is everyone in this room, no turning back. We're, we're lifted up in Adventism first. We become the outcast of Adventism as the everlasting gospel, the first temple cleansing, is accomplished from the beginning of the sprinkling on September 11th, 2001, until the Sunday Law. And then at the Sunday Law, we're lifted up before the world because national apostasy is followed by national ruin and because Satan appears to personate Christ and Satan knows who everyone in this room is. And his only purpose then is to blot out the faithful so that he can have complete control of the world and they're lifted up before the world because they have a bunch of enemies that they've made since September 11, 2001 that are going to cooperate with the people in the world in identifying who they are and where they are and what they are. And we get to just stand on the shoreline as the east wind holds, the east wind, as Islam's doing something that allows us to stand on the shoreline and watch the armies of Pharaoh get out into the middle of the Red Sea. And then the east wind's withdrawn and we go home to stand on the sea of glass. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've brought us to this Sabbath. You've brought us to the point in this prophecy school this week. We've received far too much information to comprehend what you've given to us at this point. We know that we have to work through these, these messages over the next short period of time, but we, we can tell that you've been speaking to us, each and every one of us. We've, we've recognized your presence And we thank you for that through this week. We thank you that you have been pouring your Holy Spirit out upon us, that you have been accompanying uh, the work that's going on here with holy angels. And as we finish this evening meeting, we ask that you would somehow, some way, remind us all to keep our thoughts and our conversations in the realm of the Sabbath in, in such a place that we do not drive away any of the presence that you've given us and that when we retire that you would 
give us a, a blessed night's rest that we can wake up tomorrow and continue to um, eat the honey that you've been giving us for the last six days. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>